In this video, I'm going to show you how to get NES emulation up and running on the PS2 version of RetroArch. NES emulation is one of the few things that does work pretty well on the PS2 version of RetroArch. The system is powerful enough to run it, and there are a couple of options for emulation cores available. That being said, there are emulation quirks on RetroArch for PS2 that are going to be present on pretty much any core that you run, so don't expect it to be flawless, but for the most part, it gets the job done. This is also a very easy core to get set up, with most of it being drag and drop, so let's go ahead and dive in. So to get started with NES emulation on RetroArch, we need to take our USB drive out of our PS2 and put it back into our PC. And then we can just get that opened up if it didn't automatically pop up for you. And again, we'll have our RetroArch folder, which is where we put all of our RetroArch stuff. But I'm going to make a new folder here and just name it RetroArch ROMs. You can name it whatever you want. You don't even need to make this folder if you want. All you need to do really is put your NES games onto this USB stick. And they can virtually go anywhere. I just like having things organized into what they're going to be used for. So again, RetroArch ROMs. And this is where I'm going to put all of the ROMs that I'm going to use on RetroArch, so... Alright. The next thing we're going to need is NES games, and there's a number of ways to rip these these days. So you can rip your physical cartridges, if you uh, have access to do so. You could dump them from the Wii or Wii U Virtual Console, if you happen to have a modded Wii, or Wii U. It's actually a pretty cool way to do it. Or, you know, you could resort to them shady parts of the net, but as always, no download links will be provided, as that is illegal, so please stop trying to get my channel canned. Requests will be deleted. Anyways, once you have sourced your games, you just need to put them onto your USB drive. Again, they could go anywhere, but I'm just going to put them in a folder named RetroArch ROMs. But once those are copied over, we're done with the PC side of things, so go ahead and get it all closed down, take the USB stick out, and put it back into your PS2. Now, just as a quick reminder, this guide is a continuation of my original PS2 RetroArch install video, so please refer back to that video for how to get RetroArch onto your PS2, as well as making a handy PS2 browser launch tab here. But anyways, once you have that USB stick inserted into your PS2, get booted into RetroArch. You could do so through Launch Elf or from a homemade uh, icon here. And once RetroArch's booted up, we could begin loading up content. So we could do this by going to Load Content. Then we could scroll down to our USB storage device, which will be listed under Mass. And then I'm going to go into my RetroArch ROMs folder, my NES games directory. And there are all of my NES games. So let's just load up into Mega Man real quick. And we could do so by going into the QuickNAS core. And here we go. Here is Mega Man running on a PS2 through NES emulation. Again, like I said, there are a number of quirks with it. And then just to let you all know, it does seem that PS2 emulation in RetroArch runs an anamorphic widescreen, so make sure to stretch your display, so that way you get the correct aspect ratio on the games. At least, that's what it is for me, anyway. It might not be that way for everybody. I've tried messing around with the aspect ratio that is provided within the cores within RetroArch, and none of them really seem to do anything. I just had this squished 16x9 picture in a 4x3 frame until... I stretched it out to 16 by 9 manually on my display. So do be aware of that. And again, there will be a number of graphical glitches and bugs that you can expect that aren't present on normal versions of RetroArch. Now for this tutorial, I'm actually going to be focusing on FCEUMM, as it seems to have a couple less visual glitches and performance appears about the same in the games I've tested. And as you can see, when I load up Mega Man, there is no more corruption on the left side of the screen. There's still the weird interlacing problems that pop up when uh, too many sprites are on screen at once with the flickering. It's not supposed to look like that, but it's just one of the quirks we get to live with when it comes to PS2 version of RetroArch. And if you play on a CRT, it might actually look a little bit better than this. I mean, I'm capturing it through a, a GBSC at the moment, so it's using motion adaptive deinterlacing. So I don't know what that's really doing to the picture, but... I don't know. Try it out, see what you think. But I really don't like loading up games through the load content menu if I can avoid it. Instead, I really like to make playlists, and the PS2 version of RetroArch lets us do so by going into the Playlists tab here, and we can go into Import Content. Then we'll tell it to do a manual scan, 
and we're going to tell it to scan our NES games folder. So we're going to go to where we have them stored on our USB stick, select the folder and tell it to scan this directory. And then under system name, we're going to make sure this is set to content directory. It will name it after the folder your games are stored in. And then for the default core, we are going to choose, at least I'm going to choose NES FCEUMM. Make sure scan recursively is set to on if you have your game separated into subfolders. And on the PS2 version of RetroArch, I don't really recommend having things zipped up. It makes things run a little bit better, so unzip everything. But once you're done, you can go ahead and tell it to start the scan. And when the scan's complete, you can just back out of everything, and you will now have a new NES games folder here. And it should have all of your NES games inside. And from here, you could just go to a game, press... Uh, Accept on it, and then press accept again to run. And there we go, we are running NES games on a PS2 through RetroArch using a playlist. No manual directory surfing required, it's very nice. But with basic setup out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about some of the core options available to us within this emulation core in RetroArch. So if you hold down the start button on your PS2 controller for two seconds, it should bring up the RetroArch quick menu. That's what it's set to by default, so if you don't have one set, you might need to restart your PS2, go into your settings and input and set a menu hotkey. But anyway. From the quick menu, we are going to scroll down to options. So options here and press accept. And our first option is choosing a region. By default, it is set to auto. This should be perfectly fine for 99.9% .9 of use cases. But if you have a game that you need to change the region on, you could do so here. Next, we could change the color palette. And there are a lot of color palettes to choose from. I am personally a fan of the Sony CXA 2025. It makes things a little more uh, contrasty, more deeper colors. A lot of people don't tend to like it, but I don't know. I grew up with it looking like this on an NES, and the 3DS Virtual Console looks like this, and that's honestly how I prefer it to look. If you want a more natural NES look, definitely choose one of the Firebrand X profiles here. These will be the best you can get for replicating certain NES systems. But anyway... Go ahead and scroll between them, choose different ones, see which ones you like. I like the Sony one, as I said, so I'm going to choose the Sony one. And then I'm going to go ahead and resume the content. And you can see how much more oomph the colors get now that I have it selected. And then just for a quick visual comparison here. Here is the NTSC hardware from Firebrand X. And there we go. So again, choose one that fits your style and... Uh, mess around with it. Next we have aspect ratios, so there is 8x7 or 4x3. This doesn't seem to make much of a difference in my setup running through the GVSC unfortunately, so if you're running directly to a CRT maybe it will, but I like to choose 4x3 as that's the ratio that these things are supposed to be stretched to anyway, so I just prefer it. Next you could crop some overscan. The vertical overscan is enabled by default. You can Disable it or enable horizontal if you so choose. Crops 8 pixels from each side of the screen, I believe. Next, you can enable turbo buttons. So you can enable them for player 1, player 2, or both. And this will basically make your square and triangle buttons function as turbo buttons for A and B. And then you can set the delay. Next is a zapper mode. So we have light gun, touchscreen, or mouse. I don't have any PS2 light guns to test this on. I don't know if they work. They might work if you play on a CRT. I just don't have the equipment to test it. So if you have a PS2 light gun and you try this out, let me know in the comments if the zapper actually works with the light gun. It'd be great to know. Zapper tolerance. And lastly, we have show advanced system options and sound options. I don't recommend really messing around with anything within these two submenus on the PS2 version of RetroArch. Again, the PS2 is pretty limited in terms of emulation power, so you can enable these and then you'll get access to things like overclock and sound quality options, but I really don't recommend messing around with them on PS2. 
as I've experimented with them, some things work okay, but others have caused lag. And I honestly just don't think it's great to mess around with it. You might screw something up and get worse performance, and I don't think anyone really wants that. But I'll go ahead and enable these just so you can see what some of the advanced options are, and you can decide from there if you want to mess around with them. So you turn the toggles on. We got to go back into our game and then back into the quick menu to get them to show up. So now when we go into the options menu, you can see that there is now an overclock option, RAM, no sprite limit, allow opposing directions, show crosshairs for the zapper, and then of course sound quality, duty cycles, master volume, and then you could also enable or disable different channels for the NES audio. Again, I don't really think it's worth messing around with for most people, but if you feel so inclined, go ahead and give it a shot, see what you think. But that's going to do it as far as core options are concerned. Again, not really a whole lot to mess around with here on the PS2 version. But once you have everything set up the way you want for NES emulation, make sure that you do save it as a core override. So that way, every time you load up an NES game, these are the options that are going to greet you. And normally in this part of the video, I'd talk about shaders, but the PS2 version of RetroArch doesn't have them. So we can just kind of dive into gameplay here. But that's going to do it for NES emulation on the PS2 version of RetroArch. Again, one of the systems that runs pretty good on the PS2. There will be a few visual hiccups and stuff due to just interlaced video, I believe. I don't know. Again, I run through a GBSC, so I'm not sure what the visual issues are. It might just be RetroArch itself. I don't know. But that's really going to do it for this one for now. So as always, thank you all so much for watching these tutorials. It goes a long way to really helping out the channel and keeping it growing. So I can't thank you all enough for that. We are very close to hitting our goals and getting the place self-sufficient. And I can't thank each and every one of you enough for that. But if you haven't already, be sure you hit that like or dislike button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, also be sure to hit that sub button so you can see when new tutorials like this go live as well as reviews and other fun videos that I like to put out. If you'd like to further help support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or check out the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Little really goes a long way to keeping this place up and running. And like I said, we are just so dang close to having this place being self-sufficient. Thanks to all of you. So thank you so very much. Thank you to all of my champions. Thank you all. You friggin' rock. But that's going to do it for this one. So until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, stay awesome, and we will see you all back next video.